But uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 9, and verse, starting at verse 35. We're carrying on the series uh, today that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Uh, and this time we're turning to uh, churches, a people sent into the world. Uh, we're going to take this, this passage as our starting point. So Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, not the clouds, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now somebody uh, came to us and said, I've got good news for you. What would we be expecting to hear? What would be, we be expecting somebody to say to us that is, would give us joy and that would fill us with good news? Would it be something like winning the lottery or a new car or a big TV? Would it be the end of the pandemic? Possibly. I know for us, um, and possibly some of you are bored of hearing it, but one of the good news that we've, a piece of good news we've had recently is that Stefan got a job and that kind of filled us with joy. Um, so I can't answer what would be good news for you in a way, uh, although we'll think about that in a minute. But there's a huge disparity between what God calls good news and what we might think of as good news. But first of all, I want you to think of somebody that you know. What would be good news to them where they are now with their worldview, with their code of ethics, with their circumstances and circle of friends? For instance, how might the good news of the gospel relate, for instance, to a young teenager at school trying to find their way in the, in, and their place in the world with so many messages coming at them from their peers, from influencers on social media, from celebrities, from that little screen in their pockets about body image, about how to dress, about where pleasure and fulfillment are to be found, about sex, about gender, about the environment, about possessions, about right and wrong. How would the gospel be good news to them today? Or think of a single parent struggling to make a living, pay the bills, help their children and teenagers negotiate a way through while making choices about their own lifestyle and leisure time and priorities. What would be good news to them today? Or a loving husband in his 80s, who recently lost his wife after 60 years of marriage and sits alone in an empty house with his pictures, his memories, and very little else, except for a monthly visit from one of his children who lives far away, and seemingly no real reason to carry on living, no hope in the present or the future. What would be good news to a person in those circumstances? And each of us have our own peculiar and particular set of circumstances that we face today 
What is good news to us? Well, I don't suppose on the face of it that someone saying to me that your life is going in the wrong direction, you need to turn around and go in a different direction because God's kingdom is near. I don't suppose that that sounds like terribly good news to start with. But this is actually what Jesus was doing in those days. Because if we link uh, verse 35, where he says he was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, if we link it back to chapter 4 and verse 17, the first words that Jesus says is, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In other words, he was saying to people, you need a change. You need a change in direction in your lives. And it's amazing to think that when Jesus said that, crowds, literally crowds, followed him. They wanted to hear that message. It sounds stunning to us that anyone would want to hear a message about changing direction. And yet Jesus' message is called the good news of the kingdom. And if we had time, but I'm afraid you're going to have to do this as homework, um, if we had time, we'd look at all of chapters 5 to 7, which is commonly called uh, the Sermon on the Mount, about what Jesus was talking about, a change of heart, about a new relationship with God, about getting the things inside of us right, getting rid of the anger, the lust, the jealousy, doing things for public display, and getting in a lovely and close relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. He's talking about God's kingdom coming to us, into our hearts first, so that we have a relationship with God. And that changes things. But then afterwards, from chapter 13 and onwards, we hear a bit more about what the kingdom looks like. And in particular, as the pictures show, a treasure that you would sell everything else to get hold of, or a pearl that you would sell all of your possessions to possess, that that's how we should consider the kingdom of God. And that might just about give us a bit of a hint as to what good news in God's terms might be like. Jesus promised people mercy and release. Blessing, those words at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, are all about blessed are those who, and he gives a number of ideas for that, but it's a new start and a new way of looking at life. He invited them and us to turn from our self-centered ways, to get our hearts right with God and put him in charge of our every day, trusting him for his care, for his love and for his provision, and that t turning that in turn to care for the poor and the needy and those around us. Now for me, that does start to sound more like good news. But not only did Jesus talk and tell people, he also showed that good news in action. And it was radical enough for people to listen but to follow. He backed up his words by extraordinary actions. Repeatedly, we read that Jesus healed every disease and sickness. If you look through the Gospels, the Gospels are full of stories. And Matthew gives us himself, uh, he gives us plenty of examples of that. Every type of healing, the deaf, the lame, the blind, the dumb, the paralyzed, those with skin conditions that excluded them from community life, those with mental and spiritual disorders, even the dead raised to life. Maybe we're too familiar with these stories. I know I was, and it was just so refreshing to read them again. But it helps to be reminded that what Jesus was doing was unparalleled. Who had done anything like that? His rule or his authority, if we're thinking of kingship, was also even being extended over nature, over every single power. If, if we think of him calming a storm or providing a meal for more than 5,000 people with a few loaves and fish. No wonder crowds followed him around. So Jesus brought good news into people's lives, not just by what he said, but by what he did. Imagine the effect on a community where people had been healed. 
that there are people just like this around us who could say, yes, Jesus healed me of my lameness or my blindness. And that the evidence was there in front of them of the good news that Jesus had brought. Wouldn't that just permeate the whole of communal life and change the atmosphere around? This was clear evidence to all that the kingdom of God was indeed near. There were prophets from the Old Testament like Isaiah and Micah and Ezekiel and others had looked forward to. In other words, a restoration of God's world to its rightful state. How things had been at the beginning and that this was beginning to happen in reality in that small obscure corner of the world. So to return to the question that we started with, what does good news mean to us? Does it start to ring some bells for us too? But let's have a closer look at Jesus' audience and particularly how Jesus viewed them. Because in this uh, context, Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion on the people that he met every day, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And when it says that they were harassed and helpless, it literally means that they were torn and thrown down. And when they were like sheep without a shepherd, they lacked spiritual care and guidance. I don't know if any of you um, have been watching at all Jeremy Clarkson with his um, episodes on the farm. It's a, a thing on Amazon Prime. Um, he, he used to be a Top Gear uh, car presenter, if that means anything to you. But now he's, um, he bought a big farm somewhere near Chipping Norton in Oxfordshire. And he clearly knew nothing about farming when he started. He just says, I'm going to run this farm and run it as... Uh, as a, a farm and try and do crops and that's but in one of the episodes it's all about sheep and uh, so he gets all of these sheep he, he learns how to go and do an auction and get some sheep from the thing puts them in a field and then well what do I do now the first thing he does instead of getting a dog is to get a drone to try and guide them around which that doesn't work out very well because they're soon jumping over walls and breaking them down getting into fields where they shouldn't crossing roads and just complete disaster and he just displays complete ignorance order is only restored when he hires a shepherd who actually knows what they're doing with two dogs who also know what they're doing and suddenly the sheep are in their pen all cared for and ready to be fed and whatever else they need it was kind of like a, a living parable of what this is all about but I think to understand what um, Jesus and particularly Matthew is referring to here we, again, we have to go back to the Old Testament because in this instance, Matthew is looking back to passages from the Old Testament, like this one from Ezekiel chapter 34, where it says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You've not strengthened the weak or healed those who are ill or bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. I will shepherd the flock with justice. And in Micah 5, it says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And that's in the, the passage, the famous passage that we often read at Christmas, foretelling that God's anointed one will come from Bethlehem. And in Isaiah 40, it tells us that he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. 
And perhaps it even looks back to one of our favorite Psalms, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. All to say that on the one hand, Jesus' attitude was of one of judgment on the leaders around who only seemed to be interested in their own position and well-being and weren't on the job as shepherds that their calling might have suggested. But on the other, he was claiming himself to come as God's representative, or even we may say as God himself to see the real, to be the real shepherd and to see the need of the sheep. And he would look after and care for the sheep. And we catch a glimpse of that later in John's gospel where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So not only did God come in the person of Jesus and care with compassion for those crowds and for the people with their diseases and their illnesses and their inner needs of healing, but he also laid down his life for them. This was and is a powerful message for us as well. God himself has come to us in the person of Jesus to take action to intervene and to be our shepherd as well. Now that really is good news. That is living proof of God's compassion in action. And that is a message for us today, just as much as for them. And the question comes to us too. How do we see our friends and neighbors and workmates and those examples that I gave right at the beginning, the teenager, the, the single parent, the old gentleman, missing his wife terribly. Are they like sheep without a shepherd? Are they harassed and helpless? What difference would the presence of God be in their lives, turning them and helping them to be healed and be shepherded by him as the good shepherd? Well, this poses a big question for us and for the disciples as well. What do we do in response because as we've thought right at the beginning, we are a church that is to be sent. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But the first thing that he says that they need to do is actually quite surprising. He tells them to pray, to ask God, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into his field into his harvest field so maybe our first task is to assess the need how do we look around on our community on this neighborhood on our neighbors what do we need to pray for them that god will help us to be his workers there that god will send out people who can help and can make a difference because jesus was just one person limited by geography physically because of his humanity and he therefore invited his disciples to be participants in meeting that need, the need that he saw. For me, that's amazing, that God wants you and me to be part of his solution for the difficulties that we see in our community around us. We do tend to pray about the things that are upper, uppermost in our minds, don't we? The things that are concerning to us, the, the griefs and the sadnesses that we have, the needs that we have. Jesus is asking us to lift our eyes up as, and to look at the harvest, to look at God's field and look at what's uppermost in God's mind and see what's uh, his priority. And just as we see uh, the image change from the sheep to the harvest, do we see the need as well? Are we bothered at all that people around us are hurting and lost and needing spiritual help and encouragement? I'm sure we are really. But it's just a fresh challenge, isn't it, as we think about it this morning? Well, if we are, then let's ask God to move people to help respond to that need. But secondly, and this is the exciting part of chapter 10, because the story doesn't really stop and the chapter divisions are slightly artificial. But the, the next thing that Jesus does is he virtually gives his disciples authority to do exactly what he himself has been doing and again that's amazing to me Jesus asks his disciples to be the answer to their own prayer 
Who were these people? Well, some of them we know very little about. Others are more familiar. Fishermen, tax collectors, doubters, zealots, hot-tempered brothers, even a thief and a betrayer. Ill-equipped they might have been, imperfect certainly, but they were chosen and commissioned to do a job that eventually turned the world upside down of their day. People just like you and me, we sit here and we think we're nothing special. Well, maybe we do, but we probably aren't. But it's clear that Jesus wanted individuals in just their present state to come as they were, people who might or might not last the course, but he commissioned them to go and do exactly what he had been doing, to heal the sick, to bring good news to their communities, to raise the dead, to cleanse, and to cast out demons. We were hearing from Mike a couple of weeks ago about the impact of the Holy Spirit on a church's life. Well, maybe these are the things that God would invite us to be part of in our community if we wait expectantly on him and trust that he's gonna use us because it's his power, it's his grace, it's his mercy, it's his love that reaches out into the community around us. And it's clear from subsequent events that that process of multiplication took place. The Holy Spirit came on that day of Pentecost just a few, well, maybe a couple of years later. And um, the impact of that has continued to our day to the point where now probably more than two billion people in the world's population would claim to own and follow Christ. Somebody came and told you the good news. Somebody came and told me the good news. It's my job to be good news to others as well around me. And it's clear too that the harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still relatively few. What is our response going to be to that today as we think about that? And um, just to close, um, one of the, my favorite kind of benedictions from the scriptures Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Let's just pray as we close. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.